Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Real Foot Lake. Thank you, Kelsey. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Kelsey, before I introduce today's guest, what is something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? This week at Discovery Park of America, I discovered the new Southern Artist Showcase exhibit by Kimberly Greenbug. Kimberly Bug is a member of the Oneida Nation, and the exhibit showcases a variety of her art, including corn husk dolls and beaded works. You um, and I work right outside where that exhibit is. Uh, what do you think is the, what is the item in that whole exhibit that most uh, draws your attention whenever you walk past? I think that the item that drew my attention the most and got me interested in looking at the display were some beaded blackberries and different fruits. They look so realistic. It was just really interesting to see the work that went into those to make them so realistic. Yeah, people keep saying it's making them hungry for real blackberries. When I can understand there. that. So you have only been working at Discovery Park for what, a year? Um, six months. A half a year. Uh, how is it different than you thought it would be? I think getting used to working in a nonprofit setting for anyone is, is a bit of a change. I think for me, it's just been getting into that pace. I think Discovery Park moves at a fast pace at times and settling in and getting to know the right people and setting that, that precedent of how events are going to be run has been a challenge for me, but one that I've really enjoyed. And so for people who don't know you yet, your job is to do events here at Discovery Park, the events that we put on. Of course, Lauren does the events that people come in from the outside to do, but you do the events that are internal. So uh, that's a big job. It is a big job. I found it to be really um, fun and entertaining. I've put on our military history event already and our cardboard boat regatta, and I'm really excited for the events that will come with the rest of the year. Yeah, well, you're doing a great job, and it's great to have you here on the team. Well, thank you. So now we'll get to our guest. Our guest today is Steve Watkins, a 30-year newspaper veteran and magazine journalist who has published three books and is doing a lot of other cool things that we're going to talk about. Welcome, Steve. Morning, Scott. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about where you came from. What What was your childhood like, and uh, what was your path to journalism? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm... I'm a native Arkansan, uh, consider Jonesboro, Arkansas to be my home. Still have a uh, mom and, and kids back there getting an education. I grew up on a Delta cotton farm, a uh, small farm back in the 70s and 80s. I actually wrote one of my books about that experience. We'll, we can talk about that later, but um you know, I was the only child on an 800 acre cotton farm and we worked a lot. Every once in a while, if things went well, my dad and I got to come over to Real Foot Lake and we would go fishing maybe once or twice a year. And, you know, even as a kid, I loved this place. I just thought, my goodness, why doesn't everybody come here, you know? And, uh, Gosh, went through life for 20 or 30 years in the in the in the media business. I got into that business to be quite honest with you because it's the only talent that I have uh, is writing. I'm not gifted with with uh, the gift of art or the gift of engineering or architecture or anything like that. The only and thing at what I point at what point did you realize that that you had the gift of writing? Good question. Um, Probably around the seventh or eighth grade, I remember going through an exercise in an English class. And for whatever reason, I chose to write a letter to President Jimmy Carter. And weeks later, there was a response to that letter. Uh, he had signed it. Of course, it was written by some staffer, you know, or whatever. 
But my mom thought that was the coolest thing that President Carter would respond to a letter. And from that moment, there was just a real encouragement from her and from other teachers in school. And when I went on to college, I sort of chose journalism by default. Like I said, there wasn't, you know, I didn't see a lot of other uh, alternative pathways. And to be further honest with you, I never really considered it to be anything special. You know, it was just what I did. And it wasn't until at some point in my 40s that I realized what a precious gift it was. Um, back to getting here, how we got here, um, my wife and I have done a number of things. We've, we've run some small publishing companies. We had a small ranch over in the Ozarks for a while. Last year, suddenly, I mean, we thought we were in our forever home in the Ozarks and, and life circumstances shifted, uh, in such a way that we ended up selling everything we had in Arkansas. And it was like one of those moments where you have, you know, one of those unique life moments where you realize you've got a reset. You've got an opportunity to reset. And came over here, drove around one day. We were really lucky. We found a couple of pieces of property here on Lake Drive uh, around Sandburg. And I will be honest with you, I wake up every morning eager to look out the window. I just... There is something special about this place, and we love it so much. And so uh, to back up just a little bit, um, where did you go to college? Went to college at Arkansas State University, okay. got a bachelor's degree in journalism, a master's in mass communication. And then you uh, began to pursue journalism? Is that where you, you worked as a reporter? <laughs> Started out as a beat newspaper reporter. Actually, uh, I had a short time in Brevard County, Florida at a Gannett newspaper called Florida Today. Uh, we were the Space Coast newspaper. Hey, that's Got Al Newharth, right? Al Newharth, exactly. I have stood on Cocoa Beach behind Al Newharth's home. Have you really? That's great. Yeah, that was years ago. I actually got to stand on Cocoa Beach to watch Discovery launch which was the first launch after Challenger two and a half years later. That was a real exciting moment. Now, did you ever uh, uh, get to meet Al Newharth himself? I, I did not. Yeah, he's a fascinating character. I did not. Uh, the newspaper where I worked in Brevard County was called Florida Today, and it was actually the prototype newspaper for USA Today. Yes, it was, yeah. For those who don't know, um, Al Newharth was the, also the founder of the Museum which is where I used to work and where I moved from the museum to work here at Discovery Park. So i um, very familiar with Al and with uh, his logo and the color. What, there was a color he used on all his letterhead. I can't remember now. Orange, peach. Orange. Orange, that's right. Orange and um, blue. Yes, that's exactly right. So, so you became a reporter. Uh, how did you like that, that gig? You know, um, I started out at the Jones, well, I spent about a year in Florida, made my way back home to be a real, I was beginning to realize at that point I wanted to be around family actually and be back home um, and spent a decade at the Jonesboro Sun newspaper over in Northeast Arkansas. Beat reporter, covered politics, higher education, business. Um, and again, you know, it was not, it, it never really felt like anything special. And what I didn't realize through that process is how many people I was meeting along the way. And I had known, this is a weird thing, but I had known from the age of 14 what my dream job was. And my dream job was to be a, a press secretary for a member of Congress. And in 1997, I was doing some political interviews with, with candidates for Congress, met a candidate in the first congressional district by the name of Marion Barry, which is interesting because at simultaneously there was a mayor in Washington, D.C. named Marion Barry who had a real problem with cocaine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you can imagine the, the, the name issues that we had to overcome in that campaign. 
I mean, I was uh, looking at your bio, and until you just now said that, I thought you had actually worked for the cocaine Marion Barry. So. No, did not did not work for Mayor Barry. Worked for Congressman Marion Barry of the first congressional district of Arkansas. He passed away two weeks ago. Oh, you're kidding! That's too bad. And, and was was a huge mentor in my life. But we met. Uh, we're very like minded. He needed a press secretary. He invited me to come on board for the campaign. In, in spite of ourselves, we won that election. And it got to spend several years with him doing that work, went on to be his district director. And uh, gosh, at, at, at 30 was living the dream job. That's, that's great. And then um, did you continue after that working for any newspapers and in and, and the journalism biz? I um, landed back at Arkansas State University as director of development. I was uh, I oversaw the fundraising program at Arkansas State. We had an endowment of about forty-two million dollars, and we raised. We had a team of ten people that raised about six or seven million dollars a year. Did that, and I, it was another kind of turning point in life where I just really felt the need to pursue some things on my own. And I left a great job to create a small publishing company in Northeast Arkansas that published uh, monthly publications, annual publications, quarterly pubs on arts, philanthropy, society, and that kind of thing. Now, about about what year was that? This was uh, that transition from Arkansas State back into the publishing world was around 2005, 2006. Okay. Okay, I'm just thinking about the evolution of ink on paper and, you know, how things have evolved. And, oh, my goodness. You know, they've evolved so fast in the last 20 years. I was just curious about what, which, which time of the evolution that was. So uh, things were starting to evolve uh, during that time. They were starting to evolve during that time. And for a small business person in the publishing industry, many of your listeners may recall that there was this little event in 2008 called the Great Recession. Um, we had built an amazing business in Northeast Arkansas that I watched go completely into the tank uh, in, a, in an incredibly short period of time. I literally lost everything I had. Mm. I lost everything I had. Um, ended up going through a divorce, went into a, a pretty dark place for several years. And that is ultimately how I ended up uh, in Spain on the Camino de Santiago, which launched a whole other chapter of life in the literary world. Yeah, I'm, I'm very fascinated with that. And I'm sure a lot of people... Uh, listening, don't know exactly what that is, or they may have heard of it. So, will you talk a little bit about about that pilgrimage and and what that was all about and what it meant to you? My goodness, it was. Uh, yeah, I hope I can talk about that without getting too emotional. I in twenty had the Great Recession in oh eight. Uh, for several years, I was. Just, it was for the first time I'd lost everything. And it was, I'm a pretty driven guy. I'm pretty A type. I mean, on the personality profiles, I'm kind of one of those guys who's always moving ahead, looking forward. And for the first time in my life, I didn't know what tomorrow was. And that was a very dark place for me to be in. Um, just coped and managed through that for several years. And I actually, it sounds kind of trivial, but I watched a movie one night called The Way. It's got Martin Sheen in it. And it's about this pilgrimage experience in northern Spain called the Camino de Santiago, which is translated the Way of St. James. Pilgrims have been going to northern Spain to the Camino for 1,100 years. Its, its roots are in the Catholic Church. I'm not Catholic, but people from all walks of life um, for one reason or another, converge at this experience, which begins in the south of France, makes its way all the way across the Iberian Peninsula, and it's concludes. 40, forty days, right? It was forty days for me. It's five. It's it's five hundred miles and change, backpack and a pair of shoes, and it concludes in a village called Santiago de Compostela, 
which is believed to be today the burial site of St. James the Apostle of Jesus. Um, as I mentioned, people go there for all different kinds of reasons. I went because a 40 day, five, you know, roughly 40 day walking experience alone sounded like a good way to me to go and think. And that's exactly what I did. And it, long story to it, but there, you know, at the, at the, here's the thing about the Camino, which ultimately I think disappoints a lot of people. And there are a lot of people on that pilgrimage and in that experience who are, who are broken by way of personal experience. I mean, what, you know, whatever it may be in their life and they're going seeking answers. And, you know, just because you go on that experience and those final steps doesn't mean there's going to be some grand epiphany or some grand revelation or the good fairy's not going to come sprinkle magic pixie dust on you. At the end of it, uh, you know, honestly, it had been a great experience, met a lot of people, but I still didn't know. And so I came home wondering to myself, was this just a different kind of vacation for me? Or did it really mean something to the greater good for my life? And I started looking at the notes I had taken on my phone. I'd spent a career in journalism, but never, you know, written anything like a book. But as I looked at my notes, they looked like chapters in a book. And so I did the only thing I knew to do. I sat down and I started writing. And I did that to figure out what the experience had meant and it ultimately meant get back into the world of writing. And so how did you do that? The only way I knew how, I sat down, I made a few notes, I created an outline, and I really just started telling the story of what had taken me there, what the experience was like, and in that manuscript i was i was very transparent about my brokenness and so the process of writing that book was a was a really good healing experience for me um i got the chance in a few months after it was published a friend in franklin tennessee had invited me to he had a friend who was the marketing director at an REI store in Franklin. They had just opened up, invited me to come to a presentation there. I did it. It was great. That was on a Saturday. Um, I did not know that this was happening, but when I left from the presentation, the marketing director at the Franklin REI sent a note to every other marketing director for REI in the country. And on Monday, my inbox was full with invitations virtually every REI in the United States to come do a presentation. Wow. And so I considered that, knew it was probably a once in a lifetime opportunity. And uh, over the course of the next year, I visited 75 REIs to talk about the book, pilgrimage, you know, what that was like. And so it, that was a, that was a cool time. That was a pilgrimage all in its own. It was, it certainly was. Now, did you self-publish this because you have the expertise and the knowledge and the know-how, or did you have a publisher who published it for you? <laughs> Ultimately, I ended up self-publishing that book. I, I clamored for years to break through into the traditional publishing world and have spent some time there with some literary agencies and um, actually two different agencies I've spent time with. And it's funny because I took that manuscript to a, a conference in Asheville, North Carolina, before it was ready to be published, pitched it to, you go to these conferences, you, you get the opportunity to kind of speed date with agents, you know, at a point during, and I sat down across the table from one of the most prominent Christian publishing agents in the country. And he, he spent 20 seconds 
And he said, you can't write this book this way. And ultimately the next year, that book was named nonfiction book of the year at that very conference. So <laughs> there, there was a little bit of redemption in that. Um, but yeah, it, uh, the, the, it was a self-published book. My second book was a self-published book. And um, my third is, is actually just a digital book. I'm, I'm working on my first nonfiction novel currently. Well, the, the, you know, the, the way that music evolved and changed and became more and more digital, the music industry changed, the uh, television industry changed, and uh, the book publishing industry has thankfully changed. And, you know, I'm a real big champion of people being able to now write and publish their own books very, very easily and very, very inexpensively. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about your retreat. Um, so what what precipitated this move back to the Real Foot Lake area? And and by the way, folks were just listening to this, but I can see you, your house is beautiful. It's a very traditional looking Real Foot Lake cabin type uh, house. It is. We're right here on Lake Drive. Um it's got the old knotty pine in it. This house was built in 1962 and I walked in it and I said, this is it. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful. The windows along the side, I'm assuming they face the lake. They do. They do face the water. We've got a couple of pavilions out there. I did a little, I do a little fishing every day. Um, yeah, but you know, uh, as I mentioned, my dad and I would come over here if we were lucky, uh, from the farm, um, and, and, and do a little fishing or a little hunting. And I continued to come here as an adult. In fact, I developed a tradition eight or 10 years ago to bring my mom over here to Boyette's uh, in, in the first week of January every year. And we'd come over and we'd eat at Boyette's and we'd watch the Eagles. And there was always this, I don't know, there was almost, almost like a spirit connection to the Tiptonville, Sandburg, Hornbeak area. And... I never, I don't know. I, like I said, we, we were in the Ozarks. I had actually started a cattle ranch in the Ozarks beginning a couple of years ago. And uh, we ran into some neighbors <laughs> who didn't like cattle. The next thing I knew, I was getting a letter from lawyers representing people who didn't like cattle. And it was a big mess. And uh, as much as we had invested in it, monetarily and blood, sweat, and tears. I looked at the wife one day and I said, you know, we don't need this. Let's just liquidate it all. And we did. And it created this, this moment, like I said, a, a, a reset moment. And it occurred to me real foot. And we came over, I contacted a realtor. We literally came over here in one day and we found a home and we also invested in a lodge that was for sale that had been here for 20 years. Um, so my wife runs the lodge. I'm actually building, currently building another lodge on the other side of the lake. And the thing that I love here as much as just, you know, the aesthetics and the beauty and the fishing and the hunting, the people here are so nice. Everyone has been so friendly to us. I mean, we've been, we've just been welcomed into the community and got great neighbors and life is good, man. It's just, yeah. uh, we love it here. So what's the secret? A lot of people uh, find challenges in their lives and sit and ruminate and never, never get out there and make changes. You've pushed the reset bu button multiple times yeah. in your life. What, what's the, what's the inspiration that you have, or what's the secret help out the people that are listening that are in a place now where they're sort of frozen? Boy, Scott, that's a great question. You know, growing up on, a farm, kind of an isolated farm in rural Arkansas as an only child. When we weren't working, there wasn't, there weren't a lot of other things to do. I literally spent a summer reading a set of Encyclopedia Britannica's <laughs> from A to Z. I, I read the whole volume of books and it created in me 
a hunger for a bigger world. And I tell people that, uh, in fact, I've got a young daughter right now who's finishing up a degree in speech pathology. She's in Costa Rica currently at a Spanish immersion school. I don't know. I think we, I think we got off track somewhere a couple of decades ago when we, when we began to instill in our young people that the path to success is you go through high school, you go to college, you get, you become whatever, you know, I find that the best education for anyone is to get away from where they are, to see other places, to, you know, it doesn't have to be Spain or it doesn't have to be Ecuador. It does, you know, it just go somewhere you haven't been because we get in this mindset of the way that we do things that's the way to do things. And there are a lot of different ways to do a lot of different things, right? So I, I've always believed that you should always be a rookie at something. Um, you should always be learning. You should always be pursuing. And, you know, I, I guess it's just part of my DNA. I, to, and, and I guess this is part of it too, Scott. I have failed at a lot of things in my life. Um, I'm one of those guys who's not really fearful of risk. And the more I fail, the less I am afraid of risk. And so I, I think taking chances and as cliche as it sounds, you know, not just room, as you said, ruminating on those dreams, but actually taking action steps toward those uh, the more we do it, the better we get at it. And it, it seems like uh, just listening to you that the journey has been part of the fun, not just getting where you're trying to go, but just the journey, like the pilgrimage that you went on. You know, that, that seems to have been a reward for you. It, it ultimately was. It was. It was a dark experience that sent me there, but it, it ultimately, you know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys, I, you know, I, I think God works everything out for us. Uh, whatever stupid situation we put ourselves in is, is ultimately worked out for the good. And we just have to be open to that. Now you've got a great idea, a, a, a new thing. I don't know if it's new or not, but I think it is. And so we're going to talk about this writer's retreat as soon as we get back from a short break. Great. Real Foot Lake is a natural wonder famous for its bald cypress trees, nesting bald eagles, and waterfowl of all kinds. From Real Foot Lake State Park to Lake Isom National Wildlife Refuge, a visit to the area provides a whole world of nature to discover. You'll find year-round hunting, fishing, bird watching, canoeing, kayaking, hiking, and more. To plan your experience, visit realfoottourism.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. It really does help us get the word out about Discovery Park of America. Okay, so welcome back to Real Foot Forward. I'm here with uh, writer, uh, journalist, a uh, businessman, a uh, farmer, um, ag, ag um, cow raiser. You, you've got a whole lot of uh, uh, titles uh, in your past. But the thing we're going to talk about now is this weekend retreat that you're putting together. So now uh, you're also joining us here in this region in the tourism business in a way. You're going to be bringing folks in uh, for this really interesting event. Tell us a little bit about the Writer's Retreat. On September 21st through 24th, we're going to host a retreat, not a conference. I'll talk a little bit more about the difference that I see in that in just a moment. But um, one of the first investments that my wife and I made here was at uh, a place previously called Hobie's Lodge which uh, 
had been a hunting and fishing lodge for 20 years. We were fortunate enough to uh, meet the owners. The timing was right. He was selling. We bought it. It's it's a beautiful venue right here uh, on Lake Drive on the lake. You can literally step out the back door and watch the eagles swoop down and see. I mean, just it, it, it's it's a it's a really pretty place. Um, I have had in in my literary life, I've had an associate for about ten years now. She's been my editor throughout my career. Her name is Beth Jacino. Uh, Beth lives in Seattle, and back during the COVID era. Beth and I came together to do uh, a four-day class, Zoom class, on self-publishing. It went really well, and we had kept it in the back of our mind that we might do this something similar together again one day. Beth and I have uh, three or four memoirs published between us, and we thought, why don't we put together uh, an event where we talk about storytelling as it relates to memoir so many people you know over the course of their life will be told you know oh you've got a great you've got a great life story you ought to tell that story you ought to write a book you ought to do this you ought to do that and that's great but there's a lot to it and there's a lot to think about in the process of publishing a memoir um, there are different reasons to write a memoir. And I tell people that one of the first things I tell them when, when we talk about this is that despite what someone else may have told you, one of the first things you need to know for yourself is why. Why are you writing this? There are different reasons to do it. None of them are wrong, but the knowledge of the why guides the process. If I'm writing something that I just want to preserve for my family, that's a different story or it's a different process than thinking that I've got a message that the bigger, greater world should hear, right? So anyway, um, Beth and I decided that we would take advantage of the beautiful fall in Tennessee and that we would do a retreat, not a conference. Our lodge will accommodate uh, about 12 people comfortably. And we wanted to create an intimate event where we could literally spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with, with aspiring writers, uh, talk about you know specific things as it relates to their work in progress or the project that they have in mind. And we're finishing up the promotional materials on that now uh, i think we'll go public with it in just a few days we're limiting because we want it to have a personal intimate feel and we want our participants to have that kind of experience we're limiting it to 12 people and and what will uh they experience when they when they come, whether they drive or fly into Memphis and and come, right. what what, what tell us a little bit about what they can expect. They can expect a very relaxed atmosphere in a very scenic place. Um, and because I have experienced this on similar retreats before, it is a unique experience for everyone to be housed or to be lodged at one place. You get to make friends. You get to have deep discussions about your work. Um, and hopefully you leave this experience uh, having made a lot of friends, having made connections, having learned. We will have throughout, we'll, we'll begin on a Thursday night, we'll conclude on a Sunday. And throughout that time, I mean, we're building in a lot of time for experiencing you know this beautiful place but beth and i will teach classes uh that will address things like you know what are the elements of a memoir what you know your brain actually works a certain way as it relates to story the brain almost wants a formula when it comes to storytelling and when we're talking about memoir Those stories are best told when there is a protagonist who is dealing with a problem and works through that problem over the course of story. 
Um, I will do a class on voice, which, you know, voice is <laughs> voice in literature is one of those things we know when it's there and we know when it's absent, but it's very hard to define. It's very hard to define what voice in literature means. We will talk about things like, uh, the, you know, in memoir, we're, we're dealing with real people from real places. And, and we'll talk about how to treat characters, how to fairly treat people, and how people can be unfairly treated. And, and even just as importantly, how to treat yourself fairly in that process. Um, you know, we'll talk about how to bring readers into a scene. We'll talk about things like plot. Uh, I, I'll actually do a, a short seminar on managing the emotional highs and lows of creating a memoir. Uh, we'll never forget the process of narrating my second memoir for the audio book. And because that was also a very transparent book about a relationship with my father and, and the circumstances that we, our farm found itself in in the 1980s, I was literally, I did, I think I did 16 two hour sessions in a studio to record that book. It's one thing to write it. It's another thing to verbalize it. And it was exhausting. Did you, I'm curious, um, did you find things when you read it out loud after you had written it that you thought, I wish I had written that differently? I think probably I occasionally stumbled on a place where something could have been done differently. Um, if, if, you, if you listen in the right places on, on that recording, you'll actually hear me choke up a couple of times. I made the decision uh, in the editing process to leave that as it was mm -hmm. because I thought it reflected the gravity of the moment. Well, God bless you with a good uh, reading voice. So, you know, you, you were fortunate to be able to read your own memoir, which made it e makes it even more poignant, I'm sure. Yeah, one, it, thing I, one thing I notice is that part of this is also going to be what to do once you've written the memoir and the publishing options. I think a lot of folks don't understand what is out there now uh, for them to be able to publish their own book instead of, you know, a lot of people may think, well, I'm not going to be trying to pitch my books to a publisher and an agent. And it, that all seems intimidating. But now, thanks to self-publishing and Amazon, it's really been put in the hands of, of anybody who wants to publish. It has been, you know, as you alluded to early in the conversation, the publishing and literary world began to undergo some radical changes uh, 15 or so years ago when the brick and mortar stores began to get out of business. Um, authors literally had to become the entire team or to understand how to manage a team oh, over the course of several years. Um, and, and I'm one of those unique or not unique, different kind of guys. I love to sell as much as I love to write. Um, because of my background in communication, um, you know, I also had to learn as, as things change, I had to learn about communication platforms and which elements of the platforms you put together to, 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 to kind of build a tribe, right? As authors, we became responsible for, you know, we were the, the leader of our sales team. So I, you know, and, and you want to have this great sigh of relief at the point where you actually get a book on a shelf, right? But there's a whole other aspect to the business following, you know, when, when it comes off the press. And I've, we'll talk to people about, about building that tribe and how you can experiment with different, uh, you know, social media platforms to build a unique platform for yourself. And, 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 and all of that really relates to understanding who your audience is. Just because, you know, there are people out there with, 
you know, 250,000 followers on Instagram doesn't necessarily mean that my work appeals to the people who are on Instagram. So you have to kind of learn that you have to begin to build a database for yourself. Um, lots of, lots of different aspects to you. There, there's the art of publishing and there's the business of publishing. Well, and I noticed that uh, in your agenda, there's opportunity for folks who attend this to also visit Discovery Park of America. So yeah. I'm very excited about that. I'll personally welcome them here to Discovery Park if they come. And uh, there's a lot of uh, creative inspiration here at Discovery Park for people to find. Um, so if somebody's interested, where can they find more information about the retreat? You may email me. Uh, my email address is steve at steve-watkins.com. Or you could go to our Lodge website, which is realfootsportsmansLodge.com. And there is a tab on the menu uh, labeled mini conferences. And it will guide you through the process of, of maybe becoming one of our 12 participants. Fantastic. This has been so interesting. And I, if you're willing, I'd love to have you back on after the conference to hear how it went and get some more details about it. You bet. I appreciate you having me. It's, uh, I was, I've had the chance, Scott, to, to visit Discovery Park twice since uh since dana and i have moved here and it is i was literally just telling talking to a neighbor this morning about discovery park and what an what a gem i mean what a gem it is you guys do a great job over there congratulations on all that work it is something for this region to be so proud of yeah, thank you so much, and um, I happen to agree with you, and we're very blessed that, that uh, Robert and Jenny Kirkland saw uh, the opportunity to put someplace like Discovery Park here in Northwest Tennessee. Thank you to all you listeners who have joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here, as we were saying, is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Discovery Park of America.